Kevin. Yep, I'm All ready. Right. All right. So welcome, everyone. My name is Laura Parings. I am the Director of Programs and Education at Rare Book School. And I'm Evan Cheney. I'm the um, Program Manager at Rare Book School. And we're really glad to be here to tell you about the MC Lang Fellowship in Book History, Bibliography, and Humanities Teaching with Historical Sources and our application process for the fifth cohort of fellows. I'm going to keep admitting people as they show up here. So <laughs> there's a, a brief lull in the action, just forgive me. Go on ahead and disable the weight room so people will just be able to populate straight in. Excellent. All righty. Okay, so as a few more people are joining us, we are going to use the, um, the Q&A function here in Zoom to handle questions and comments that you might have. We will uh, take time at the end of our brief presentation to answer questions. We'll cover uh, ones that came in with the registration form for anybody who might not be able to attend tonight, and we'll share the video with them afterwards. Uh, but please do feel free to enter questions, comments. Um, you can upvote other people's question if you also want to, to know the answer to that. So uh, feel free to use that function. If there are any problems with sound or technology along the way, please do feel free to interrupt us and let us know. All right, so we'll begin with a little bit of background information about the Lang Fellowship. This fellowship is, um, is funded by an individual named Michael C. Lang, who attended a liberal arts school as an undergraduate, and uh, his experience with the Special Collections Library at his school had a profound impact on him. And now he wants to help today's professors, librarians, archivists, uh, and other professionals working in these institutions to help create the same sense of wonder, of curiosity, and appreciation in their undergraduate students. To make students more aware of the significance of the original physical primary sources, not just the digital surrogates, um, and what the physical objects can tell us about the history and indeed our present reality um, of a culture. And in Mr. Lang's words, the Lang Fellows can take their newly acquired teaching tactics, techniques, and strategies back to their institutions and undermine a serious side effect experienced by many of the undergraduate screen addicted. A misplaced belief that physical books and other material sources are nothing but cumbersome, transparent, and outdated containers of the texts that they convey. He knows that the fellows in this program will individually and collectively reinforce the useful value of primary materials in academic study. Further, he hopes that the fellows will, through their passion and enthusiasm, instill in at least some of their students a sensitivity to the pleasure of associating with physical books, a pleasure which may very well enhance the lives of those students long after they have left the academic world. So the goal of the fellowship is to reanimate humanities teaching by equipping educators, and that's professors, librarians, archivists, and other staff members who might be working in fields like DH, et cetera, uh, for instance, with the skills to enlarge their students' historical sensibilities through bibliographically informed instruction with original historical sources, in particular, humanities teaching at liberal arts colleges and small universities where that impact can be uh, profoundly felt and that mirror Mr. Lang's own experience as a student. So the idea is to inculcate wonder among the students at these institutions. So, the fellowship includes tuition waivers for two rare book school courses. Uh, it's a two year program, and we'll talk more about those two classes in a little bit. Um, but I'm just going with the big picture overview for now. Um, so two tuition waivers, um, an annual stipend of $1,500 for travel, housing, food, course books, or whatever other expenses that you might incur while taking these courses. Um, third, there are matching funds of up to a thousand dollars available for each year of the fellowship program. So the way that works is each year after taking the course, you may request a thousand dollars from the Lang Fellowship Fund, and it will be matched, um, ideally by funds from your home institutions. So 
what we what are the goals of these funds? The goals are to um, use this money to build your book historical community at your home institution. And it can be used for things like um, teaching materials for a collection or exhibition vitrines or for running a speaker series or a symposium. Um, we're going to go over some other examples that current fellows have, have been working on, but um, ideally the money is going to go to whatever it is that's going to best serve your community at your home institution. All right, folks, this right here. Projects um, may also be undertaken with other Lang fellows. So whether those co those fellows are in your cohorts, um, either in this cohort or in a year before or after, um, or whether they're at your school or a nearby school. Um, if you want to get together and work on a project together, we encourage you to do so. So a key component of the fellowship is the idea of building community. And that's not just about building the community um, at individual institutions and among the undergraduates, but also among the fellowship cohorts. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that we have the structure in place to have the 10 members of each cohort start their program by all taking the same course together in person in Charlottesville. And uh, we'll talk about that course a little bit more in a moment. Um, but the reason is that it, the fellows learn a lot from each other each year. Um, as you can see in some of the quotes that we'll have here in the slideshow, um, it, the students, the fellows ra rather, get to learn not only from our instructors, they learn from the other fellows. Uh, some of the fellows work together to, uh, to uh, engage their communities at their either because their institutions are near to each other or even those that are not particularly close together. Uh, but they work together on projects at some times to make sure that, um, that they're all benefiting from what each person is bringing to the cohort. And so uh, that the quote that we have here is from uh, one of our current fellows who took a class last summer, um, who remarks upon the, the twofold benefit of taking that first class, the H-165 course taught by uh, the executive director of Rare Book School, Ms. Michael Suarez, um, who imparts a lot of information about the teaching, about the importance of bibliographic and book historical approaches and skills as well as how to leverage all of that knowledge to educate the undergraduates. And the second piece being that the Lang cohort had a marvel really marvelous resource. It, it itself was a resource um, that this fellow felt forming over this week and that they looked forward to relying on after this. And we have certainly seen that in requests for the matching funds as people have coordinated together to bring in a speaker series where somebody might be speaking at two proximate colleges um, or where they might be working together on um, another form of project where it's engaging the, the classes in two different institutions. So as Laura was just sort of uh, indicating, um, the H-165 History, Bibliography and Humanities Teaching um, is taught by Michael Suarez in your first year of the fellowship. And you can see that we have the dates already set for that course, uh, June 9 through 14 uh, of this coming summer. So um, mark it in your calendars. Um, the, the course for H-165 is guaranteed admission. So if you get if you become a Lang Fellow, you, you know, you just apply to it, but you're going to be guaranteed a seat in that course. Um, and then the second course is an elective course. So you choose which whichever one that you may want um, from our catalog uh, on our and you can find our course uh, list on our website. Um, unfortunately, it's not fully. Uh, we haven't fully um, dialed everything in for 2024, but we're really close. So stay tuned for the rest of the courses, but obviously you can see a list of past courses if you wanna start browsing and see sort of what, what might be on offer. Um, 
it gets kind of tricky when, uh, you know, now that we have online courses, um, so we say that you can take an equivalent of one full length course, which is sort of like two of the shorter online courses, and we can help you sort of navigate that distinction um, if, it, if that's some, something that will come up for you guys. Um, and the only, the only negative is you will not be able to take H90 because you will have already taken H165, which is the sort of Lang specific version of that course. So really you're getting the full experience of that anyway. So we hope it's not too much to restrict that from you. All right, and just one last note on that. Um, one of the other distinctions of that second year course is that you're not guaranteed admission as a fellow. So you are applying along with the rest of the RBS community. Uh, which can be a little competitive depending on the course that you're interested in. So the important thing there is just to make sure that in that year you are applying before the first round deadline of applications. Happy to talk about the details of that a little bit more later if you um, are unfamiliar with our process. Um, and certainly Evan and I are available by email, by phone um, to, to help walk you through the process in that year and uh, kind of keep track of your applications and making sure that you uh, get into a, a suitable course. So in addition to the community building and taking the classes and learning skills, the fellowship is also uh, very much about that multiplier effect. So making sure that what you learn in those classes then gets shared with those undergraduates that you're serving um, to help inculcate wonder. And so um, it's, it's an important element of the application. Um, I have the privilege of serving on the selection committee for this fellowship. So I know that a, a piece that we always seriously discuss for each applicant is how much of a multiplier effect that, that applicant would have, whether they understand how they would be um, sharing what they learn if it matches what the goal of the fellowship is. And so uh, we have a quote on the next slide talking about uh, this multiplier effect. So uh, this is, again, referring to um, that H-165 course. You can see last summer's cohort gathered there with Michael Suarez in our special collections library at UVA. And the quote reads, watching Michael Suarez teach in special collections with rare books helped give me new ideas as to how I might approach teaching with special collections materials in both similar and different ways. I also appreciated that Suarez emphasized collaboration as part of the Lang Fellowship between faculty and librarians across campus, et cetera. The conversation of how we will transform book history culture book historical culture, forgive me, on our campus with the matching funds gave me ideas on both projects for how to spend the money and who to approach as partners and collaborators. And so uh, eligibility is one of the questions that comes up a lot uh, from people considering applying for this, um, this fellowship. And so uh, we have a list of the requirements on the website um, for the Lang Fellowship. And it's and this is the, the pertinent section here. So uh, it's intended for full-time tenured faculty or full-time tenured track faculty who have passed the third year review or full-time library curatorial staff members also after having worked at a school for about three years um, at liberal arts colleges and small universities. And the definition of that small a uh, qualifier there is 5,000 or fewer undergraduates. Might be a little bit over, but um, much over 6,000 is going to be a little, it's, it's on the border of whether it will be considered. Um, and we're happy to uh, talk to anybody individually if they have a question about their school. And that school needs to be located in the United States. So one of the questions that came in on our registration form was about whether this would be open to um, to people in the UK. If you happen to be a UK citizen, but you're working at a US-based institution, then yes. If you are teaching or working in the UK or else anywhere outside of the US, then no, unfortunately. Uh, so the uh, following classes of applicants are ineligible. So that outside the US is one of them. Individuals employed by universities that award doctorates. 
there's an exception there um, for there's a lot of schools that have like a pharmacy program attached to it. Um, if it's just a, a doctorate in pharmacology or something non-humanities related like that, an exception will be made and that applicant is eligible. Uh, that also comes up with like education and medical fields and in, uh, beyond pharmacy. So um, anyone who has previously taken more than two rare book school courses or who has already taken that H90 teaching the history of the book course simply because it's so similar to the course that's taught specifically for the Lang cohorts. So if you've already taken H90, you've already done part of the program and that makes you ineligible. Also ineligible are past or present members of the RBS full-time year-round staff. So shucks, Evan and I will never be able to apply. <laughs> All right, I think that covers it. So we'll move on to the application process. Yes, and I will be your guide through the application process. There are several steps. Um, you know, it can be a little daunting to, if you haven't gone on our website in a while or if you've never been there before to sort of navigate through it. Every year we make changes. So we're, we're gonna help you. So basically um, once you go on our website, um, which is uh, rarebookschool.com.org. <laughs> .org, excuse me, it's right there. Um, the the uh, Up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a tab for My RBS. So you can go ahead and click on that. Um, and that's sort of our, our um, portal for handling the applications. Um, and as you can see on this screenshot, we have us... Uh, selecting the admissions and awards tab, which is where you'll find the MC Lang Fellowship in Book History, Bibliography, and Humanities Teaching with Historical Sources. So you've probably already made it to that page. Um, but once you click on that My RBS tab in the upper right-hand corner, you'll find this page, which uh, is your login information. So if you um, have an account already with us, then you can just input that. Um, and if you haven't made an account with us before, welcome. Um, you'll just need to click on that uh, need an account in the lower right-hand corner under the big red login bar. One quick caveat here is that um, sometimes if you need to reset your password for whatever reason, um, we've been having some, some technical difficulties with that email sending out. So if you don't receive that email in a timely fashion, then just send a uh, RBS programs, um, an email, um, and we'll, we'll make sure that you get that link so that you can reset your page. Okay, so then once you've penetrated into the, into the page here of the um, My RBS landing page, um, you'll, it'll look like this. And if you scroll down, you're just at the very bottom, when, when you open the, the, the browser window, you, you'll just barely be able to see it. You might have to scroll down a little tiny bit, but you'll see where it says scholarship and fellowship applications at the bottom. And, um, it'll look like this. So as you just imagine it scrolling down and, uh, on the right hand side of the screen there, you see the MC Lang fellowship with the uh, link at the very bottom that says click here to apply. So obviously go ahead and do that. And it will take you to a page that looks like this with the big blue apply now um, button on it. And that's going to take you through to Interfolio, which is where we handle our applications. Um, if you've done uh, you know, applications for academic jobs, you'll know Interfolio well. So here's what it looks like. Um, just the main thing here is you have to sign in with your Interfolio account. And if you don't, obviously you need to create an account. The important point is you do not need to pay for an Inter Interfolio account. So if you are prompted to do that, um, let us know if that's something that's causing you problems, but this, this should be free. There should not be any extra cost uh, to, to go through this process. So yeah, let us know if you need help with that. And um, if you have trouble making the Interfolio account in the first place, if you're new to it, 
then um, that's not something that we can help you with. So you would need to contact the Interfolio support page. If you remember back to that sort of uh, my RBS landing page, and if you scroll down towards where you found the Lang Fellowship, just below it, but on the sort of left side of the screen, you'll see a link to the Interfolio support page. I've highlighted it in the screen here, um, but that's where you would go if you have any sort of Interfolio related technical problems that, that we again don't control. Um, and we can obviously help you to the best of our ability, uh, but yeah, they'll also, they also will be able to help you. Okay. All right, and so the meaty part of the application materials themselves. <laughs> so you will be prompted in Interfolio to fill out a brief contact information and eligibility form. Uh, that's just to give us an, enough information to make sure that we reach you with the, the decision of the application and just to do a, a, a due diligence check that you do qualify to apply for the fellowship. You will then be prompted also to update or upload rather a curriculum vitae. Uh, we don't have a page length requirement on that, so um, it can be long or short. Share the information that you think is relevant for uh, the evaluation of your application. And then you will have the option of inviting one of your colleagues or your supervisor um, to submit a confidential letter of recommendation. Uh, this is something that should be done during the uh, the completion of that application form. The recommender does not need to create an Interfolio account. They will receive an email with a link that will take them to a page where they can upload it. And uh, it will see that it was submitted. You should be able to see that it was submitted, but you won't be able to read it. We will be. Um, and so that, that person, um, We'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of the person you might want to think about asking to write that letter for you. And the final component is four short essays. These do need to be submitted as four separate documents. Uh, each one is a roughly a one page single space maximum. You can go a little bit over, but don't make it, you know, a four page thing <laughs> uh, or even two full pages. So the questions that you will be asked for those essays are here on the screen. You can also find them on the website for the Lang Fellowship um, so that you have a chance to work on them ahead of time if you would like. So the first one is, why do you want to be part of the MC Lang Fellowship? What interests you most about participating in rare book school courses? The third is, describe your experiences of and commitment to undergraduate education. How does working in liberal arts um, contribute to your efficacy? And the final one is, how might you work with others to create an educational culture of book historical humanities teaching with original sources? There will be some overlap in the way that you're answering these questions, but each one is designed to pull out a, a specific set of information. So um, there can be some repetition, but please do flesh them out fully um, in response to each question. And so about that letter of recommendation, it should be written by someone who can speak to your suitability for the Lang Fellowship. So uh, someone who can talk about your teaching, your outreach efforts, your impact potential, um, dedication to teaching with primary sources, bibliography, book history, and to that, creating that spark of curiosity within the students. And just to add to that, that um, your letters of re recommendation can be sent by email to RBS Lang, sorry, RBS underscore Lang at virginia.edu. That is a key email, so I'm going to repeat it. Um, that's also the help email if you have help with anything, and we'll show it up again at the end. Uh, so it's RBS underscore Lang, L-A-N-G, obviously, and then at virginia.edu. Um, so again, if your recommender is having trouble with the Interfolio portal for whatever reason, um, they can just email it to us and we will accept the letters up to two days after the application deadline, but please let us know if it's on its way just so that we can expect it. Um, but yeah, they can just send that to rbs underscore lang at virginia.edu. Okay, so now 
And then we also have, um, once you make it to the finalist stage, um, you will need to submit a um, letter of support, which we'll supply the form for, from your supervisor at your institution before we can award the, the uh, fellowship. And that just, basically it just confirms that your home institution will support your efforts to build a bibliographical community um, and will commit to matching the funds of the Lang Fellowship. So that's obviously to your benefit, um, just making sure that, that, that the institution is behind you there. And just to be clear, um, this letter of support can also be, it can be submitted by the same person who wrote the letter of recommendation. So it's a different letter, but it can be written by the same person. All right, so the selection process, once you've submitted the application, a committee uh, will meet and review all of the applications that have been submitted. So what makes an application successful? As I mentioned, there are 10 fellows in each cohort. Um, and just before we kind of get into the uh, the details of what this committee is looking for, for I will mention that uh, the committee will be meeting either in December or very early January. And so the finalists will be notified in January. Our course applications for next summer will also open in early January. Uh, and the first round deadline will be set sometime in mid-February. We haven't set the final date yet. Um, so there's time after the fellows have received their notification of their award. Um, for them to submit the application for that first course this summer. So the committee it's, is looking for um, really what we've been talking about, how you're gonna be sharing what you learn with the students that you interact with at your school. Um, and it's, I will say that something that has come up occasionally is um, more of an emphasis on how you're going to share it with the students rather than how you would share your uh, your work in like how it would increase or improve your, your research and impact publications that are intended more for your peers. That can be a part of it, certainly, because that will help to and may perhaps inspire others to do similar work in their teaching but it is more about that community um, and how that seed that you're planting at your home institution will flourish in that school. So um, it's, it's important to be looking at um, whether that's teaching because you're in a professorial track or if it's about how you're sharing with, with classes that come to visit your library, um, your DH center, uh, we have, a variety of backgrounds represented in uh, in the Lang Fellowship, different fields of work in different um, departments in uh, different sizes of universities. Some are very small, some are a little bit larger. Um, and so it, we can get into particular questions if you have any in the Q&A, but the really important part is to focus on that sharing and a, a clear vision of what you would be doing with what you learn it can change. We're not going to chase you down and say, you said you were going to do an exhibition <laughs> that you never came up with. Um, but some sense that you have thought this through, it can help sometimes if you have um, other in, colleagues that you might be working with. Um, and a question that sometimes comes up about whether two people from an institution can, the same institution can apply in the same year. Yes. Uh, they do have to be separate applications because it has to be awarded to individuals rather than to uh, a pair or a trio. Um, and so it, we have certainly awarded within the same year, we have awarded um, to people in different um, different cohorts, but from the same university. So it's, it's something that um, if somebody else at your institution perhaps already has the fellowship, it will be discussed by the selection committee, but it won't necessarily negatively impact your application. We do want to make sure that the, the funds are being spread so that they can do have a maximal effect uh, for the undergraduates 
in the country. And um, so it depends a lot on who else is applying in a given year. If you've applied in the past and are interested in applying again, please do. If you have specific questions about perhaps feedback on your application from a past year, please do feel free to email me. Um, you can just send it to that rbs underscore lang at virginia.edu that we shared in the chat and uh, and we'll work with you um, to provide what, what information we can about that past application. All right. Evan, over to you. So as promised uh, many slides ago, uh, we are gonna sh discuss quickly some of the things that some, the current Lang Fellows uh, are working on. Um, but I just wanna, again, sort of start with a quote that I think helps um, sort of talk about the experience of being a Lang Fellow. So I'll just read it. You demonstrated through the exercises and object lessons how creatively as well as deliberately one can teach, speaking to Michael. While I was hopeful that the class would be terrific, I had not anticipated how eye-opening it would be, a regenerative experience that will have ramifications well beyond my teaching in book history. Um, so this fellow has clearly had a, a sort of um, illuminating, but also potentially fruitful uh, experience in the course. And, you know, one of the ways that they're able to envision that is through that sort of um, multiplier effect that Laura mentioned. So taking what they've learned and sharing it with others and through different kinds of projects. So here are some examples, um, book historical panel discussion, um, a faculty learning community, there's been a transcribathon um, along with a speaker series. We've had many, many, many speakers um, with workshops, um, which is a great model. And another thing that we've um, had more and more requests for is different kinds of materials for teaching collections, um, whether it's you know actual um, rare books or whether it's facsimiles or materials for printing. Um, starting a printing lab or a printing press um, or or any other kind of thing that you can imagine, um, that's a viable use of uh, the matching funds. And um, we anticipate that you guys will be adding to this list as well. So uh, we're hopeful to see that what you guys come up with. And so I'm going to turn it over to Laura, and she's going to um, address some of the questions that you guys asked in your um, when you sort of signed up for this meeting, and then also any that have appeared in the Q and A over the course of our uh, presentation. Yeah, and once I've gotten through a few, uh, I'll pause, and um, if you would like to unmute and chime in here, please do feel free to, to do so. So one of the questions that came in on our um, Q&A was specific to lecturers in art history at Dartmouth College. Am I right in thinking that Dartmouth has graduate degrees or is this a different Dartmouth? I haven't had a chance to peek online. Let me take a look. <laughs> so the question is just that, um, in part lecturer versus a tenure track. Um, and that is something that we would need to discuss with the selection committee. I haven't actually had that question come up before amazingly. So um, we'll wanna double check that, that that's, we're all on, on the same page about that, but um, departments and programs, let's see. As long as it's under about 5,000 undergraduates, and the teaching is mostly done towards undergraduates. All right, let's see. Medicine departments and an MBA curriculum. As long as there aren't doctorates in the um, uh, humanities, there is a chance. So um, we can, art history does not have graduate students. Okay. STEM graduates. As long as it is just STEM, then um, then yes, and we can certainly check into uh, that question about the lecturers versus tenure track. 
Um, so if you want to uh, send a, a private message in the chat with your name, uh, we can make sure that we get you uh, a final answer up to that question. All right. And we also have, uh, are institutions obligated to approve matching funds or just to consider? Uh, I.e. is the relevant administrator committing $1,000 just by writing a letter of support. So it is not an obligation. It is possible that you could secure the matching funds from another source, but it's a sort of goodwill intention. Yes, they will consider approving that. Um, and there's there's a pretty good chance that you would receive $1,000 in each year um, in the matching funds. So it's more of a an intention of goodwill, a support that yes, you would have the time to take off um, each year to attend a course um, and that they would support uh, the initiatives that you would bring back to the university or college. All right. There's a separate there's a separate process for requesting the letter the matching funds. So then they will have a chance to review your project before committing the funds themselves. So that we part of that process will ask for a letter from them. So that's sort of like the confirmation that they have in fact committed the money rather than as Laura said sort of just um indicating support for your project in a more general way. Yes, very good point. All right. Um one of the other questions that came up in our registration form was about um the format of our classes and whether there's online versus in person and things like that. So quick overview, um, the traditional rare book school course, so most of our in-person courses, there's one exception for next year, um, they are five-day courses. They run consecutive five days. The one exception is uh, a four-day class that runs at um, Oak Spring Garden Foundation. Uh, but the five-day format is what you're going to find for the rest of our in-person courses. So H-165, the first course that would uh, be taken by anybody who's admitted to the Lang Fellowship, is five days. We do kick off on a Sunday evening um, of each of our course weeks with an opening reception. We recommend that you attend. It is not obligatory, um, but it's a good way to, to mingle and get settled in and get your name tag and things like that so that you're not rushing as much on the Monday morning um, for the classes. Each of our classes in person has roughly 30 contact hours with the instructor, so or instructors, plural. So it's usually um, an 8.30 to 5 format in Charlottesville, and sometimes it's a little bit different in our remote partner institutions, depending on library hours there. Uh, but there are breaks throughout, so it's, it's four... Um, 90 minute sessions through each day. Friday ends a little bit early, so it is a slightly different format, but there's there's a good closing party on Friday, so it's good fun. Um, and so uh, that's the standard format for those. We run most of our classes in Charlottesville, but we do have a number of uh, remarkable partner institutions with whom we work to, to host additional courses usually because they have collections that we just can never match in Charlottesville, either with RBS's own collection or with the university's collection. So um, there was a question about Nebraska and the closest uh, courses there. I am pretty confident in, in saying it. I am entirely confident in saying that Chicago will be the closest um, to Nebraska. Uh, we will be debuting two, um, well, three, we hope, courses in um, in Chicago next summer. So excited about that and more on that when the full schedule of courses gets announced, uh, hopefully in just a few more weeks. So um, online courses, we will be offering a selection next summer. They will also be running in the fall. Um, we've sometimes run them in January and they vary in length. Some of them are 22 hours, so that counts as a the equivalent of one of our five-day courses. So if you were thinking about doing an online class for your second elective, you could do a, a single 22-hour. 
Uh, there's also 12 hour options. So two of those would count for one. So your second tuition waiver for the fellowship would count to cover two 12 hour courses. And we also have six hours that, uh, that are shorter and it could be three, six hours or two, six and one 12 to get to the full, um, the full length experience of a course. Those are options. Um, we do recommend that you take the courses in person to really emphasize that hands-on physical object experience that you can take back to your home institution, but you are certainly welcome to do uh, an online course in your second year if you need to. The initial course H-165 is only in person um, and only offered that one week per year. Um, in terms of the online, there's also another uh, variable at play here. Some of them are going to be five day. They're they're set within one consecutive five day period. Not if they're, it's like a six week or six hour rather, um, it might not happen <laughs> every day of that week. Um, but we are also using uh, an extended format where it, a course might run for uh, like an hour and a half to three hours. Um, maybe one day a week, maybe it's two or three days a week over multiple weeks. So there's different formats available to try to make the courses more accessible to more people. Um, and I'm going to pause there to see if there are any more questions. And I'll check over in our Slack chat thing. <laughs> Oh, yes. Thank you, Evan, for making sure that we emphasize the travel funds available. So that $1,500 um, travel and housing stipend, um, you you request it, you claim it. If you don't need to use all $1,500, you could use part of it on covering the cost of the recommended reading list books for the course. We're not going to ask for an itemized receipt. So... Um, so those funds are yours each year, um, and you can use them as you need to. Generally, um, I see Meg's question in the chat about the second course having to be in, in the second year. We have had people who've had to defer for a year because of extraordinary circumstances coming up, um, or even something that you might know is coming up. Um, if you know it's coming up, maybe consider um, delaying applying. But if it's just a a fluke, um, you yeah, we'll we'll grant an extension as long as it's um, for you know. Actually, we'll 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 grant the extension. I won't even qualify that. <laughs> so yeah, all right. Can we save the application while it's in process in Interfolio and complete later? Yes, I'm pretty sure that that is true. You can. All right, let me double check our lists from online to make sure I didn't skip another question. We have a question in the chat, Laura, about... Oh. Um, so I just clicked somewhere else and it's gone. Um, <laughs> oh, the recommendation one? Recommendation, when are, when are everything due? Right. So the application is due on November 17th. Ideally, we'd like the letter of recommendation in then as well. Every once in a while, we have somebody who just kind of forgets or puts it off too long. Um, so we'll, we'll grant an extension. Um, as long as there's an acknowledgement from the person writing that letter that yes, they are working on it, um, we'll grant that uh, that two day extension. We'll try. I mean, we want you to have a full application. We just need a deadline to get people to submit it. So, um, so keep in touch with us if there is a delay on that. You know, sometimes people just they get sick or they you know something comes up, and so we want to be um, flexible to make sure that you have a good chance of getting the, the fellowship. And I think there was a related question followed up uh, in a little earlier about whether the recommender receives a prompt. 
So they should receive a prompt in the Interfolio system. So yes. you would you submit your um you the name and contact information for your recommender. And then once you submit the application, it will it will generate an automatic request to them. Obviously, you should let them know in advance so that they can write you a you know high quality recommendation. But um, yeah, the the system will generate that, and then you'll be able to see whether they've uploaded it, and it can be kept um, you know an anonymous, confidential. Excuse me. Yeah. So that you can see that they've uploaded, but not the content. And Evan and I will be keeping an eye on the contents as they come in. And if the day before, maybe two days before, we still don't, we see that your in-progress application is there, but it's not complete because the letter is missing. We will um, follow up with you so that you can chivy the person um, because we don't always, we don't know who it is <laughs> that we need to reach out to um, who's writing the letter. So uh they will get the, the prompt in the system. Evan and I will help make sure that you're uh, aware if the letter hasn't arrived yet and um, and we'll do what we can to help make sure that gets submitted fully. All right. So one of the other questions that came in on the registration form was how competitive the fellowship is. It varies a little bit year to year based on um, based on the number of applications that we receive. Um, it's not as competitive as some of our other fellowship programs simply because it's it's a narrower audience who's eligible for this award. So um, so it's a good, you know, people give each other a run for their money uh, with this uh, application process, but it's you still have a good chance of, of getting it. And we've certainly seen people applying a second time through um, after they didn't receive it the first time. And, and some of them have, not everyone, of course, but uh, but there's hope still um, after that first round. Sometimes the competition is just a bit stiff. We try to um, try to keep a balance of, uh, you know, so we don't end up with nine English, uh, English professors getting the awards in each year <laughs> or nine librarians. Uh, so we try to have a variety so that that cohort has a chance to really learn from from each other and getting different perspectives. All right, uh, anonymous participant has asked another question about the letter of recommendation. I just completed my dissertation. So my PhD advisor is aware of my teaching abilities and experience with manuscripts. Uh, okay, but my direct advisor at my current institutions knows about my classes at the College Museum and Students Feedback and such can speak to the support I will receive at my current institution. I'm just wondering who would be the most appropriate person to write the letter. Okay, so dissertation advisor is aware of the teaching or direct advisor about the classes being taught and the feedback. That's a tricky one. They both sound like they'd be pretty good. Um, I'd say, you know, whoever feels that you feel would be able to best rec represent the full breadth of what you're capable of um, and who can speak with good specifics about it uh, would be the person to ask. It may be a case of you can't go wrong with either of them. So um, that's that's up to you and and what you feel that they know about you and your your candidacy. Hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, feel free to ask follow-up questions too if we answer something and, and it doesn't fully address what you what you hope to learn. Excellent. Okay, good. You're welcome. All right, anything else? The application process, the courses. Just to share a little bit of information to see if it jogs any further questions. We sometimes get questions about things like the, the housing available um, at our different locations. So 
In Charlottesville, uh, we offer dormitories here at UVA, which are by far the most affordable option. Um, you know, it's it's pretty much an empty dorm room, so it's not the cushiest experience, but um, but we work with uh, the university's conference services department. Um, there's to provide one of the dorms that's one of the newest on campus, and it's an apartment style dorm, Bond House, um, for all five weeks that we're running in Charlottesville. And then we also, in July, have the option of the lawn rooms, uh, the historical student housing um, of the original Academical Village by the rotunda that's behind me in this fake background. <laughs> and uh, so those are, they, they are air conditioned now, um, but those are, you know, about 43, 45-ish dollars a night. We also work, Evan has just um, been working with two hotels in town to arrange for room blocks. Um, they're a bit more expensive, but they're within a mile walk of the classrooms and we will be in uh, our brand new finished, very spiffy spaces starting next summer. Um, for any of you who, who know us well enough to know that we've been experiencing renovation um, exile <laughs> for the last few years. We're really excited to be moving back very soon. Um, really next month is the start of, of the shift. So, um, so there'll be, it'll be a great experience to be back in the library next year. For the remote courses, uh, if it's, if we're working with the university, we do all we can to provide dorms there as well, uh, because they're also usually the cheapest. Um, and in a lot of the cities, if even if we can't do the dorms, we do work to arrange for those hotel uh, block deals to help with the costs. The walk is 0.6 miles, if you want to be precise. Well, <laughs> that's even better than I thought. <laughs> but it might be up a hill too, so. There are a lot of hills in Charlottesville, that's true. Okay. I think we've answered everything from the registration page. Double checking the nuances. Yep. All right. I don't see anything new in our Q&A or chat. So if you do have additional questions, do not hesitate to email rbs underscore lang at virginia.edu. I hope that we'll hear from many of you with applications this year. And uh, we hope that even if you don't, that we'll see you at Rare Book School before too long. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good evening. <laughs>